Good day, everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Ayers, and today we're going to be talking about Git and uh, getting good with advanced Git. So let's dive in, shall we? Uh, my, like I said, my name is Chris Ayers. Um, I've actually recently joined Microsoft. I'm a senior customer success engineer there on the fast track for Azure team. Um, you can find me on Twitter, LinkedIn. Um, I blog about technical um, topics pretty much all over the place from DevOps to programming to Azure to infrastructure, you name it. Uh, have a little bit of technology ADD. Um, and there's my GitHub. You'll be able to find some resources out there. Um, I will share some of these notes and scripts on uh, my GitHub. So I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, so our agenda today is we're going to do a little bit basic recap. Um, we'll dive into Git internals. I'll, I'll actually show um, a commit on the command line using some low-level tools. Uh, we'll go into stashing, we'll talk about rebase, um, ref log, uh, reset, and try to do an interactive rebase at the end. So let's dive into the basics, the recap. Um, I've worked with many customers in my consulting career. Quite a few of them come from the TFS or SVN background. And so they're very used to the centralized version control where the, the server has full control and lets people check code in or check code out. Um, a lot of times it also does diffs between the versions. And so when you're talking about version uh, four of a file, it, it needs to know apply Delta one, Delta two to file A, apply Delta one. And so sometimes it, it can take a long time to do big checkouts uh, of things um, farther back or current versions because of all these diffs it's managing. Uh, Git is fundamentally a little different. Um, everything is a snapshot. Um, it takes a snapshot of the current um, state of the working directory when you do commits, when you, you check stuff out, and we'll show that. Um, I, I really want to kind of look under the hood a little bit because I think it gives you a better understanding of what's happening as we look at stashing and rebasing. And so there's a concept that's laid out in the books uh, on Git, their SEM, there is a book that is maintained by the community and they, they put forward some ideas of porcelain and plumbing. And so if you think about this, um, porcelain are the tools that are designed to be used by end users regularly. You know, if you go into a restroom, you want to be able to turn on and off the hot water. Um, you don't really care how it's wired or all the different steps that are happening under the hood. You just have a nice, simple interface. Right, turn it on, turn it off, uh, flush the toilet, what, whatever you need to do. Um, plumbing, though, has all these low-level components that together make those porcelain parts possible. And so I want to peel back the hood a little bit and dive into what's happening under the hood when we do a git add, when we do a commit, um, when we do a checkout, because I think it's really going to help solidify it in your mind. And I'm going to show a couple of graphics and, and try to explain a couple things. And then we're going to do it on the command line and show you exactly what it looks like in the git repository and what it, what's happening. So Bear with me for a few minutes uh, as I try to kind of lay the groundwork. But pretty much all of Git is just a hash or an object. And, and I know that <laughs> that's a very simple statement to say, but um, there's a couple of types of objects. There's really only three or four types of objects inside of Git, but everything else is just a hash. And that's how all of the things are referred to and how they're referenced. So when we're hashing something, we have some content, be it uh, binary data, be it strings, be it a source code, be it a readme, and that gets put into what we use as the SHA-1 hash, and that spits out a hash value of a number of letters and digits. Um, for the same content, you can run that hash function over and over again, you should get the exact same hash. Um, if any of the bits change, if any of the letters change and the content going in, it should give you a completely different hash. Now I realize there are hash collisions. Those are things where two different sets of content give you the same hash value. Hackers love that. For our purposes, just each unique 
content going into a hash function should give you a unique hash value. And so let's say we have a source file or a readme or something. That is usually just called a blob. So a blob is some sort of content. It has a length and then it has the actual content. In this particular case, we're saying hi there. Hi there has content of eight or nine uh, characters in size. And when you hash that out, you get this, this hash value, 6530, blah, 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 blah. All right, so as we work with Git, we don't just work with, with content. We don't just work with source code floating around. We have to deal with directories. And so that is an object type in Git as well. That's called a tree. So a tree, which has its own hash, um, that way you, you know if something has changed in the tree. If it, um, it has what's called a mode. Mode is like read, write, execute. That is the like attributes for the file system. It, it lets you know, is this file writable? Is it readable? What type of content is in this tree? It's a blob in this case, but it could be another tree. Um, it has the hash of that content and the file name for that content. Because Git is just a collection of objects, you could have two or three files with the exact same content. They might just show up in different trees as different names, but it could be the exact same content. So you don't need to have three or four different objects for the same content. Um, once it's in there, hi there, that blob 6530, it only needs to be in there once. So our tree pretty much is our directory listing. Um, so once we've got our tree and we've got our file, then we can make a commit or we can have other trees. So in this case, look, we have a tree Maybe we made a backup of our original folder and it's a, it has that, that same content. It has a single blob, 6530, with the name hi.txt. And now we have a new tree that also has the blob, 6530, with hi.copy.txt. They both refer to the exact same piece of content, but then this is also referring to trees. So, so we have nested information around that. Um, and like I mentioned, maybe we, we have a commit and our, the commits point at the hash of a tree. So we're saying we're going to commit in a folder with a file called hi.txt that has this content. I'm the author and my message is updated commit. And then, you know, if I were to do a second commit, so that was my first commit. If I was to do a second commit, with that, that folder in the back, hi.copy. Notice commits are kind of linked lists. So they always point to the parent that came before it. Um, I, I realize this is confusing, but I want to dive into the command line and show you I just one more example. Um, so this is from the Git SEM site. So yeah, see our first commit, we've got a tree that has some hash with a content and it's got, got some versions. We could get a second commit and there's a tree and we have maybe new files. And then maybe we get a third commit and we have a back folder and that refers back to maybe that folder that had one file called text with version one. As we start adding more and more commits and we add more and more objects, one of the things that happens is um, we, we, we only have the unique set of objects. We, we don't have all these diffs. We don't have um, all these snapshots. We have an object for a commit, an object for a tree, an object for each unique set of content and each unique set of trees. Um, there's a lot of reuse inside of Git. And so as you work with Git, another thing you'll work with is branches. So in this particular case, you know, uh, they're called refs. So master might always point at, you know, whatever content that is, but test might be a different branch pointing at a different commit. So let's go through and do a command line commit and look at what branches and, and, and things look like on the command line. So I have a little script running here that's running a tree. I have a, a an empty directory. Whoops. 
So I have an empty directory. And when I do git init, what this is going to do is this is going to create a git folder, dot git. And it's, this is showing you what's inside the git folder. Now we don't need um, the hooks folder right now. I just want to move that out of the way so that we have a little bit less um, to deal with. But remember I said we had porcelain and we had those, those plumbing commands. So let's take a look at, at what those look like. Um, one, whoops. So let's say I just echo, hi there. That's some content. So hi there is some content. And if I pass it into this, this plumbing command, hash object, Hash object takes content, and in this case from standard in, and it outputs a hash for that content through SHA-1. Now we didn't change our git directory, this is just a plumbing command, but if we start wiring things up or passing additional options like, hey, write this to our git database. We've now written this hash 63 or, or 6530 into our objects folder. But if you notice, it doesn't have the whole um, hash as the file name. What it's actually using is the first two digits for a folder and then the rest of the, the file name as the actual file. Um, that way as you start adding more and more objects in the git they're not all living in one objects folder. Well let's take another look at that. So let's cat that that file. So if we do cat git objects 65 Oh, we got some gobbledygook. That's because things are compressed. And it's not just pure text. There's a different plumbing command that we can use to get the content. So if we do cat file minus p, which, which prints, we can then say something like 6530. Um, you don't always have to type the full hash for every object or reference. You can usually do partial hashes, usually just three or four. Uh, digits or letters that's enough to recognize it from something else. So now printing out object 6530B63, it's high there. And just like I explained earlier, let's take a look at what that looks like. It is a type of blob. And we can even get the size. So we have a couple of ways now with cat file to explore the content inside of our Git repository. Well, Remember, we were going to save that content as, whoops, as a file called hi.txt. So I'm going to update the index. Well, let's see what that looks like. We'll get status now, thinks in my local working directory, I should probably have a file called hi.txt because, you know, that's just like kind of a git add. But if I look, it doesn't exist. So it's kind of confused says, oh, you've got a file, but it's not there. And I can't get log. So I've kind of added a file with that content to my working directory. Um, and here's another plumbing command, ls files. It thinks that there should be a file in my working directory. Well, let's, let's add this directory, this tree, into our Git ref uh, repository and see what happens. So I did a write tree. So I've written the local kind of working directory index into Git, and now there's another tree object there. And just like before, where I can say, hey, print out 0514. It's got that mode I talked about. It's got the blob and the hash of the content and the file name. And I can say, what type is it? It's a type tree. All right. Let's just clear that. Um, now let's do a commit. So I just made it a little bit bigger. Hope that helps. So we can do a commit tree. So to remember, commits rely on trees. You, you commit a tree, and we're going to give it a command line message of command line commit. So now there's a third object in there, and with a 2815. Let's do a kit cat file. And print that out so we can see the tree that I was pointing to the 015 0514 just like before my name and my message so let's do a git log still not working let's do a git status 
still not working. Well, here's where we talk about those branches that I mentioned before. Um, the current branch is listed at head. So you can see our current head is on refs heads master. Well, let's look at our tree here. Refs heads, there's no master. So that's probably where the problem is. Well, we, you can usually manipulate what branch you're on or what commit you're on by doing a git checkout, um, which is one of those nice porcelain commands. Well, we, we can do some other things ourselves with our plumbing commands. So we can do a, maybe an update ref. So we're going to update a reference for refs heads master. And we want to use our commit hash. And again, I'm only using the partial. So now if I cat, notice it expanded it to the full thing. Uh, head is still pointing there. Let's try to get status. Okay, it's saying there should be a file that's deleted. Let's try our git log. Git log works now. So now it knows we're on head. Head is on master. It knows it's got a commit, but I still don't have a file. Well, there's an easy way around this. Um, most of the time, with many of the git commands, you could do a minus minus dash dash after your, your command and you can say I only want you to do it on this one file. Well we know it is expecting a head.txt and we don't have a head.txt. So I can check out only head.txt. So if I look, it's now there. I can cat the contents, it's got what I want and I can do a get status and we're clean. So We've manipulated head, we've manipulated our references, we've explored objects and trees. This has kind of given us a dive into what some of those plumbing commands are doing under the hood. Um, another little uh, cool plumbing command I want to share. Um, there's one called rev parse. So you you know, if I'm, I'm curious what what master is, it'll tell me. I, if I'm curious what, you know, 0285 refers to. So rev parse will take any of those, those characters, those uh, branches, those tags, and you can give it a partial or, or full name, and it'll tell you which object or which commit it's referring to. And so it'll, it'll parse your... Um, you know, refs, heads, master. It'll parse these references and give you that the hash that it refers to. So, I just wanted to to circle back. So that's kind of what's happening under the hood as you do these commits, as you're doing branches. Those plumbing commands are manipulating the branches. The they're creating objects in the Git repository. They're updating trees based on directories and they're linking through the commits. So that's all happening under the hood for you. All right, next demo. This is a fun one, um, git stash. So let's say I have a repository. I've got a file checked into that repository and I've got like a basic little web page. And you know, I, I start doing some work. You know, I, I've got my demo of stashing in there and I've got a request to work on a, a different feature. I could check that into a branch for some people. That's the right option. For others, you can just do a git stash and what this is going to do is it's just going to take your changes um, and it's only going to be changes to track files. It's going to ignore, if you have ignored files, if you have files that are just in the directory that haven't been added, that won't, and you know what, I can actually show that. But, you know, I, I've done the stash and it kind of has reset it back. I can do a git stash 
the list and this is showing I have a stash uh, in my uh, <laughs> list there. Um, there there's a number of options so you can show so if I wanted to show it was saying that I had one file changed you notice there's also a pop and an apply um, I'll talk about that and there's also a um, push and save so we'll go through a couple of these they're they're all um, they're all kind of fun so you know we did we did the git stash and it kind of reset my tree back to the way it was if I want to get that back I could do a pop and what pop is gonna do if I look at my git list again it's actually gonna take whatever was saved in my stash or take the top one off and actually remove it from the stash list and reapply it to my example um, if I if I stashed again and listed yep it's still there I could do an apply and so what apply will do is apply will take whatever was in my stash reapply it to my local working directory but what it won't do is it won't remove it from my list so it's still there um, so let's do if I say get stash again it puts me back to where I was on master and if I do the stash list you can see there's now two um, I can now either apply them or pop them um, so if I do that pop it's gonna take the top one which is now different stash it's gonna put that there and if I look at my list there's only one left if I try popping it again it doesn't like it because I'm not in a clean state I'm in a, a modified state um, same with apply so it's saying these changes might not um, can't safely be applied so let's say I, I said I checked this in you know I did some work on it I checked it in cool so now it's complaining because I had modified the file before they both know that I wanted to modify that line I can even see um, you know if I do a git diff it, it can see the different ones I could accept both save and um, Oh, I forgot to say it was resolved. All right. So, um, just to show what I was talking about, let's add a second file. there's nothing to change uh, index 2 isn't being tracked so it doesn't know anything about it you know if I were to do it like a git reset that will actually like you can see nothing's happening um, because there was no changes for it to reset on things that it was tracking uh, there are a couple of other nice little um, effects we can do so let's say we want to name our stashes. Um, sorry, message. All right, save that. Forgot to hit save. So now if I look at my stash list, you can see I gave it a message. Um, I did I did save, so what it'll do is it'll put it away and kind of clean things up. But now I can do get stash pop. 
and you can say there we go so we did a couple things we get stash um, I do want to show this one this one is really fun um, there's this website out there uh, get school github io visualizing git and it is this site and it is awesome um, because you can explore Git and how the different nodes interact without going crazy on a local repository. Um, and I want to talk about like merging and what merging looks like versus rebasing and kind of talk through it. And then we can, we can do some of that interactive stuff. So what's nice is you can just say git commit and you can see I'm on master and it, where the head is pointing and you can see some partial hashes on these things. But then I could say git branch feature and I'm on a feature branch get checkout feature um, so head is on feature and I could do get commit so I can add a couple commits and right now nothing's on master so if I checked out master you can see head points back to master and let's say I want to merge feature into master So what just happened was master was here, feature was there, and Git realized that there were no not a lot of work to do. Like it could just apply the check-ins from feature to master and everything was fine. And so that's called like a fast forward merge. It just fast forwards. Let's say instead merge has a commit. And then feature has some commits. And now let's say we want to do the, uh, the merge. So what happens now is master can't just apply features check-ins um, because there's now a difference. The, the closest ancestor is back one. And so what's going to happen is it's going to make a merge commit that that pretty much just adds the merging of those. And I'm, I've started moving away from being <laughs> a fan of these. Um, I really like rebasing now. So let me, let me kind of show you uh, what that looks like. Let's just go ahead and hit this drop down. We'll reset it. So we got it reset. So let's do a git commit. So let's add a couple of commits. All right, so I just wanna be clear. You need to, when you're rebasing, you're doing it from being from the feature branch for the most part, okay? So instead of like doing a merge from master and pulling in and just having another checkout, um, that just adds additional merge commits. It's, it's kind of confusing, but let's say we want to rebase master. So what's going to happen is it's going to take all of our check-ins from feature. It's going to pull them to the side and then kind of add them to the end of master. like we branched from master's current state right now. So, and what that's also going to do is if you notice this hash is now different than that hash. So this one, it's parent was one, eight, one. This one, its parent is now 972. So this hash and this hash for the commits are different, but it pretty much pulled, pulled the three commits off, went to the end of master, and it started trying to apply each commit in order. Um, if we're happy with that, once we've done our rebase on the feature, let's say we set up a pull request and said, hey, can you please merge this into master? So now when master does the merge into feature it's that fast forward merge that we talked about before and what you start getting is you can get a code base it's almost like a straight line maybe it moves side to side a little bit but it's a straight line rather than all these big branches and curls and loops that can cause some confusion um, 
I know you can get in some trouble with rebase. A lot of times I've seen people either um, trying to rebase on the wrong branch or when they start getting conflicts in their rebase, um, just kind of getting stuck. Now, all of these things that we're doing right now, we're doing in our local Git database. As soon as we do a Git push and we share this with the world, um, you can't really re rewrite things easily because somebody else um, could have pulled down the code. So you, you, a lot of these things we have to be careful of um, doing locally before we push out. Yep, and, and while we're here, why don't we, we look at ref log. So you can see I had all these commits. So ref log is super powerful. Ref log will kind of show you these individual steps. So, you know, if I wanted to, um, you know, if I do git log, um, yeah, this is probably going to be easier to show in a real folder. All right. So let's, let's take a look at this. Yeah, sorry for the beeps. All right, so we got a couple files. So I'm going to do a git add file one. All right, so we added a file. You can see now we're on master. We've added a file. Um, Yep, so we've added a couple files. I know there's easier ways to do this, but all right. I just wanted to get some content in here. So we've got a couple of check-ins on master. We're good. So I'm going to do a... Uh, Get branch. Just gonna say content. So now you can see on the log up here, head is pointing at master. There's another branch at this tag called content. So I'm gonna do a git uh, checkout content. And now you can see head is pointed at content, and there's also a master there. So let's say I just um, So I echo high into file one. If I do a git status, you'll see file one's modified. Um, yeah, let's also do that in the file two. All right, so now content and master are, are, are slightly different. Um, so let's do the merge. And you can see here, it says updating, fast forward, and now everything's right. Now let's take a look at our ref log. So just like before with ref parse, we can see the, you know, if if I want to know what that is, cool. I want to look at content. I want to look at master. All of these are pointing at the same hash. Um, but notice there's this syntax here: head at zero, head at one, head at two. Um, you can um, reset 
So you, you can kind of, before I've pushed it out, I can do a get reset um, to head. Let's say I want to go before the, uh, before the merge. So now that I'm on master, um, it sees that I've modified the files, but I haven't checked them in. I, I haven't um, done the commit. And if I do a rev parse on master, you can see I'm back to EB whatever. Um, if I cat file one, it's applied the changes, but it hasn't checked them in. You know, if I did the get reset hard, reset will actually um, throw away the changes. So now if I do a get status. So ref log will show you all of the things that have been going on and let you go to them. Um, but as you make changes, these will update. So let's say I do want to go back to where I had merged. I want uh, where I had merged content in the master. Now that, that's it, head at two now. So if I do um, the get reset head at two, head is now at 3C. You can see head and master are content. So locally, before I've pushed any changes up, I can use ref log and reset to kind of rewrite history a little bit to clean things up or to undo changes. As soon as I've pushed stuff out into GitHub or into the cloud, it's written there and you, you have to pretty much um, either live with it or you have to force push, which is a terrible thing to do. And it will pretty much mess with any other developer working in the code base. So try to fix your stuff and get it clean before you, you go. Um, another um, nice thing that we can do, and I, I think I've got um, a slide to talk about it. You know, I mentioned before working directory and index and head. So when you first check out a project, a lot of times it just pulls those files like remember high.txt didn't exist in our working directory. And then when we checked out that one file, it existed. Um, as you start staging or adding files, they get added to the local index. That's where it's, um, you know, added and, and staged. And then when we commit it, it gets written out with that right tree or right object content. Um, I just wanted to walk through a scenario here where, you know, we had our Git repository, we create a file we do a git add that gets that that content um, gets tracked in the index as, as well as the tree. And when we do a commit that gets written into the repository, um, the commit does, the tree does, the file does. So let's say we edit our file some more. Um, when we look at our index, it, it'll tell us the file has been changed and when we commit, um, our commit will say, hey, we have a V2. It'll point at the previous commit, but that's where we are. And so as we keep editing, this is our life cycle. We start going from untracked files that we add. They're modified. We edit them, stage them, and we commit them. And they go back to an unmodified um, life cycle. And then maybe we remove the file if we don't want it, or we add a new file or we just edit it. And so there's this life cycle that you're going to go through as you interact with Git a lot. Um, finally, let's take a look at interactive rebase. So let's do a rebase minus, uh, oh yeah, let's look at the ref log. Let, let's go back to before the merge. I believe that it would be head at five. Oh, I probably need to be, uh, another thing to be very careful of is to make sure you're on the right um, commit. So I want to go back to probably head at three. Uh, or head at five now. There we go. So master's there. Git checkout 
content. Okay, so we updated some files. Um, let's update a few more files. And I'm going to do a couple of commits. Because I want to show you how to rewrite history. All right. So let, let's say I, I'm I'm making lots of small commits as I'm working through code, and I really don't want all these little messages maybe crowding the commit history um, when I merge into master. So maybe I want to clean these up and 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 squash them down and together. So we can do that with an interactive rebase. Now I have to do this before I push code out and share it um, on GitHub or with my, my other developers. I have to do this um, while I'm local. So let's do a git rebase minus I. And uh, master. So you can see it's showing the different commits between content branch we're on and master. So 3C for updated files, E3 for file one and two. So there's some options we have. We, again, we're rewriting history. We're rewriting our local branch essentially. Um, so pick means I want to keep this commit. I could squash it, which could maybe take two commits and push them together. I could also drop a commit, just not even have it in the list, or I could do a number of other things. So let's say I I squash three, four, and five into updated files. Um, so think of it like this is the first thing it's going to do. This is the second thing. So I'm squashing them kind of up into that. Um, yep, save that. So what's going to happen now is if you look, this is saying this is a comment. Please don't. P please don't you know, leave these terrible messages. Um, you know, maybe I just wanted to say updated files uh, one through five. There we go. Got a nice little message. And now instead of all of those individual commits, my history now says I've updated files one through five. So it's rebased it, it's remerged it, and notice this is now a different hash as well. So I've done my rebase. So now I can go back over to master and um, well, check out. I can merge content. You can see it made changes to all the files and, and now I just have one nice little squashed message. Um, And you can see, see there's some resets that are happening, there's commits, there's rebases. Um, and I can cat each of these files, they, they should say hi. Um, let, let's say we wanted to go back. Maybe we wanted to go back to um, before the rebase. So let's say we wanted to go to head at seven. Oh, I'm on the wrong branch. You gotta make sure you're on the right branch. Um, so let's see here, added, moving master content, updated files. This is why it's always fun that, all right, so, there we go. Head is there. That was the merge. Let's do the get rough log. I meant to do a different one, but head at 22. There we go. 
So git check out content. Again, always make sure that you're on the right um, branch. So that was where I had updated, updated, updated. So on this branch, I want to be at, at 11. That should, yep. And if you look over here, we are back to the content we were. Now we can do our interactive rebase again and try some different things. So let's say I did not want to update um, file five. Just go remove that. And actually, um, let's do this. So I'm going to swap four and three and I'm going to drop five and then I'm just going to leave those messages how they are. It's rebased and you can see five is gone and three and four have swapped. Um, if I, if that's what I really wanted, I could then check out master and merge over content and then updated files four, three and five is not there. So if I cat five, it just has random text. doesn't have that high thing. So, um, I'm out of time, but I wanted to thank everybody for, um, watching this video. I hope this helped dive into some of the complexities of Git and maybe gave you some tools and understanding. Um, please feel free to, to track me down and, 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 and reach out. Um, love to have a conversation. So thank you for your time.